Joining me now is Nick Uwen, Senior Editorial Director at The Point Sky. Good morning. Morning. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, let's just dive into this conversation. So on Wednesday, the Fed left rates unchanged, as many people know, the highest rates in over two decades. So how much is increasing APRs across the credit card space? Well, the vast majority of credit cards do have variable APRs, so this does directly impact the interest that consumers are paying on any credit card balances that they are not paying in full at the end of a statement period. So it's really important if you are carrying a balance, you're not paying in full, that you do pay attention because this will impact the amount of interest that you are paying, not just right now, but in future months as well. Let's dive into that uh, point a little bit more. What other mistakes are you seeing that people tend to make when it comes to paying off credit card debt? Well, the first thing is the interest charges. A lot of people don't realize that the interest charges can easily start adding up. They may start small. If you have a $1,000 balance and a 25% APR, uh, over the course of that uh, balance, you're gonna look at about $20 in interest. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem like a lot but then it starts to accrue. And as you spend more, as that interest is added into your balance, then you're gonna accrue, accrue more interest. So it can really snowball. So the biggest thing that we see is people spending beyond their means, going beyond what they can actually afford to pay off. And that yeah. can really hurt when it comes to this interest charges over the course of a year. Yeah, of course. Like you said, it all accrues and it adds up to those big numbers. But some cards over 0% APR for an initial period, such as the first year. When should people be seeking out these credit cards? Well, 0% APR cards are really great for people who are just getting started, who maybe need to lean in a little bit to learn the ins and outs of the credit card industry, uh, get more comfortable with managing that credit. It's also great if you have a large purchase or even an unexpected ex expense. I had to unfortunately have emergency surgery for my dog earlier this year, and I thankfully had a 0% APR credit card open at the time. So I was able to defer uh, the interest or not pay any interest on that charge and pay it off over time. Now, the key thing I want to point out is you want to be careful that you're opening a 0% card and not a card that offers deferred interest. So a lot of furniture stores, electronics retailers, they will offer you these really attractive financing terms for sometimes 36, 48 months. But that's deferred interest, which means that even if you have a dollar left on your balance at the end of that period, you're going to have to pay all of the interest that accrued throughout that entire duration of the promotional period. So really critical to pay attention to whether it's 0% APR where it's no interest versus deferred interest, where if you still have a balance, you pay all of that interest for the entire life of that loan. Are there any specific cards that you would recommend over others when it comes to that 0% APR? Well, there aren't any real specific cards that are better than another. You really want to look at a couple of different things. First of all, the length of time that you have access to the 0% APR. Some of them are as little as nine months. Others can even be 21 months. So that gives you a really extended period of time. The other nice thing is if you are struggling with credit card debt, you can actually look at a card that offers 0% APR, not just on purchases, but also on balance transfers. So if you're sitting looking at these high interest rates, paying an APR of 25, 27%, you could be a good candidate to open a uh, card that has no interest on balance transfers, move that high balance from a high interest card to this new card. There's a one-time fee, but then you would have a period of time to pay that off with no additional interest on that balance. You just can't do that with the same bank that you are moving the balance from. So if you have a Chase card, don't get another Chase card. You have to get a different issuer. But that could be a great option if someone is really struggling to pay off a balance and they're just looking at interest charges piling up, piling up, and piling up. And what's your take on if somebody liquidates a 0% APR card to pay off their outstanding debt on credit cards that are charging those higher interest rates? So that's a great option if you want to avoid some of those interest rates. The big thing that you want to look at, too, is the overall impact that your credit card portfolio has on your credit score. So just because you moved a uh, big balance from a credit with a, high, a credit card with a high APR to one with a 0% APR on balance transfer so you can pay it off, you still want to keep that initial card open, especially if it's not accruing an annual fee. Your yeah. credit score does look at a variety of things, including your payment history, your credit utilization. But your average age of accounts is going to be a key part of that as well. And that credit utilization, if you close a card just because you're not using it, 
that could actually make you look more risky because you have less available credit to access. So an issuer or a credit reporting agency may say that we're going to drop your score because you're more risky as a potential borrower. Yeah, you know, that actually brings me to my next point because so many people are like, oh my gosh, I have 10 credit cards. I, I should close these because I have all of this outstanding debt. However, you should keep it open in that sense, correct? Because if you close out these cards, you, you appear a high rate, uh, high risk to these banks. Yeah, especially if your card has no annual fee, there's really no added cost. And again, you're not carrying a balance from month to month. The big thing I would say, though, is to make sure that you do charge a little something to that card every few months just to make sure that you keep it active. We saw, especially during the pandemic, when banks started really restricting their underwriting, they actually started uh, unilaterally closing some accounts that had sat kind of dormant and not being used. So yeah. I have a couple of cards that I call them my sock drawer cards that I don't uh -huh. actually spend much money on, but I do charge uh, five dollars at amazon every couple of months just to make sure that they remain active and they are contributing to not just my overall credit but also that average age of accounts that really factors into your credit score can really help ensure that you remain an attractive borrower and your company the points guy aims to help people maximize travel so given the state of inflation should credit card users who earn travel related points be using them as soon as possible or should they wait for the right trip what's your take on this and do points devalue over time in your experience I wish I could say that points de don't devalue, but we've actually been facing inflation for a number of years in the rewards industry. So we at the Points Guy always subscribe to an earn and burn philosophy. Generally speaking, your airline miles, your hotel points, your credit card rewards, they are not gonna get more valuable as time goes on. So if you're sitting on a huge pool of those miles, a huge pool of those points, now is the time to burn them. Take that, that trip that you've been putting off for a while. Um, and of course, come to the Points Guy and we'll give you all those tips for how to make the most of those for your travels. Is there a specific window, though, that a uh, user should be mindful of? Uh, or is it just as soon as they pay off the bill, they see those points hit their account, they should burn them? Yeah, so it really depends on what awards you're looking at. In some cases, you can get a free flight for 10,000, 15,000 miles. But other times, if you're looking to go to Europe, maybe you're looking to fly in a premium cabin, you could yeah. be looking at 100,000 or even more. So it really depends on the reward that you're that you're looking at. The big thing, though, is if you're looking at a flight, if you're looking at a possible hotel room, the big thing is that if you see a price today, that may not be the price in a month or a year. So if you can afford that right now and it fits with your budget and your travel plans, go ahead and pull that trigger. It's really important because we have seen instances of overnight award rates on flights or award rates for hotels jumping by 10, 15, even 30 percent. So mm -hmm. use them before they really lose that value. And last question, best day to book uh, that, that flight? Uh, that is a myth that we love dispelling here at the Point Sky. There's no actual best day to book a flight. And really the great thing about all the technology that's come into the industry over the last years is there are a lot of ways that you can actually monitor flight prices yeah. without having to manually check each and every day. So Google Flights is a great option. Uh, Hopper gives you some real great insights. Uh, their algorithm recommends when to book versus when to hold off because they expect prices to drop. So really take advantage of some of those technology tools out there. Uh, and you don't even have to worry about timing it to book exactly on Wednesday at 8 a.m. because airlines have gotten really sophisticated with their pricing algorithms and thankfully there are tools out there that really help you stay ahead of that and get the best price that you possibly can. Well, thank you so much for all of that advice. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me.